Okay, let's go ahead and get started here. Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Lucas Randrian Ravello and I'm currently serving as the student government president. Thank you all for joining this town hall tonight and learning to, as we talk about learning and living with COVID. And so I just wanna say, I really appreciate all the questions you provided to us in advance as all of us live in this challenging time and continue to live through this new normal, our goal tonight is to provide you with as much information as we have to ensure transparency and we continue to evolve through the semester more and more. So thank you again, and I'm gonna pass it over to Enid now. Hi everyone and welcome. Uh, we're really excited to, to see the, the participants that we've got and we received a lot of questions and a lot of responses on, on social media. Over 3,000 people voted in the poll and we got over 100 questions. So we are going to do our best to get those questions answered for you. Um, and, and so I'm going to skip intros. That's why we had the slide right up there so you could see all of the panelists that we have here and our subject matter experts. And I'm going to dive right into questions so we can get to as many of them as possible. I'm gonna try and save the last 15 minutes so that we can answer live questions that you send to us, which you can put into the Q&A. So without further ado, let's start with a, a I'm gonna start with Lindsay. And, and I think we're gonna start with some of the, the health related questions, but big picture, Lindsay, what, what have we learned? Uh, in, in these last two years of COVID, what are things that we thought we knew and what are things um, that are more or less important than we thought? Um, well, that's a question. Um, I think we could probably um, take that um, for this entire time. Um, when I think about it though, kind of on some of the policies and practices on the RIT campus, I feel like, you know, we've really learned a lot. Um, in terms of um, some of our strategies. So we've learned that physical distancing is actually less important than we originally thought. Um, certainly being right on top of each other and breathing directly on one another poses risk, but um, classrooms um, and even um, buses are not really the place where um, transmission is occurring. We also were worried a lot about surface transmission and we're wiping off surfaces and doorknobs and everything compulsively. And again, we've realized that that's not really how the virus is getting transmitted um, from one person to another. Um, we've learned that masks, on the other hand, are hugely important and the quality of mask really matters. Um, and uh, time permitting, we can talk a little bit more about um, that um, towards the end of this session. And then of course, um, outside of kind of those public health measures, um, vaccines and medical therapeutics and stuff have really changed the nature of caring for COVID and what our level of anxiety should be um, around um, catching the virus. Um, and then, you know, it wouldn't be complete to say, well, even what COVID is has changed um, when we think about the um, transition from that initial alpha variant to the delta variant, and now, of course, Omicron. And they're certainly related, um, but really the disease picture looks very different. Um, so I think I'm going to um, end with that. Um, can I just um, ask my colleague, um, Dr. Wendy Gelbart, if she has anything else that she'd like to add to that? Well, I would say, Lindsay, you, you aptly described that we have come a long way. And I think in a previous q and I said we're living science, and that is absolutely the truth. We know it's frustrating to be living in a pandemic with ever-changing rules, but the bottom line is that as each day passes, we're learning more and we're getting better at this. And I think as we answer more of these questions, hopefully that will be apparent. Thank you, Wendy. Um, this next one is also for Lindsay to start off with. Lindsay, we received several questions about testing, um, in particular, wondering uh, whether or not we would go back to weekly testing of everyone. And um, it, could you talk to us a little bit about our testing strategy? Um, sure. So 
testing really serves two purposes. The first is to identify illness and under, um, and the second really is to understand what's happening at the population level. So in terms of identifying illness or disease, um, it's tricky to find every single case is with Omicron because it's spreading so quickly. So if we were going to be trying to find every single case of COVID on campus, we would really need to be testing people multiple times every single week. Um, and that's also true because most people in our highly vaccinated population are actually asymptomatic or have symptoms that are so mild they don't recognize them as being a concern. So um, we actually don't need to find every single case anymore, but we do need to understand what's happening on our campus and so that we can be prepared to take care of people so that we have the resources that we need um, in place. And so um, that testing strategy really has been using wastewater surveillance so that we can monitor the overall levels of COVID on campus and um, develop sort of outreach and treatment strategies in response to that. Um, did that answer that question clearly enough? Yes, thanks. So this next question, Wendy, I'd like to ask you, when RIT opened in the fall of 2020, there was a hundred case threshold over a 14 day period that would have led us to go to remote. Our case count is much higher than that today, yet we have in-person classes. What has changed and what are you watching most closely? As Lindsay mentioned with our case count, but we don't necessarily need to know all of them. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question, Enid. And I would say that comparing fall of 2020 to winter of 2022 is truly like comparing apples and oranges. In the fall of 2020, we had no vaccine, no medical treatment, and we weren't even certain of the best supportive care to offer patients. But we have an entirely different landscape now. We have vaccinations, we have medical therapeutics. We most definitely better understand the usual course of a coronavirus illness. We certainly don't understand everything, but we're learning and we're definitely in a better place than we were two years ago. Even last year, we worked very hard to identify every single case. We attempted to remove that person from active circulation in order to prevent spread. And then we really followed a rigorous protocol to contact trace every single case, find any contacts that that person might have had with someone else in order to tamp down the spread. We do know that unvaccinated people who get COVID are still at a fairly great risk of becoming se severely ill. And last year, that was pretty much everyone because very few of us were vaccinated. But this year, almost every single one of us is vaccinated on our campus. And today with both vaccination protection and a dominant circulating variant that causes a less severe form of illness, we're finding that we can relax a little bit in some of our strategies as compared to last year. In fact, our, our local Department of Health is no longer doing contact tracing. Uh, in our local schools, they're not doing contact tracing because they're really finding it not helpful in the control of spread. People are infectious for a few days prior to testing positive or a few days before they develop symptoms. So by the time one has that cough or headache, the best thing for them to do is stay home. And most often in our highly vaccinated community, people, as Dr. Phillips mentioned, will have either no symptoms or symptoms that they wouldn't even think to attribute to, to a COVID infection. So all that being said, it doesn't mean it's a lost cause because each one of us personally plays a very important role in preventing spread. And that spread begins number one with our getting vaccinated. And I can say that I'm truly delighted that our community has wholeheartedly adopted vaccination. And the other really important strategy that we have is wearing a well-fitted mask. And those two things are really going to keep us out of trouble. We know that Omicron is very infectious, but we also know that it's less severe and we're also vaccinated. 
The other thing that we know is that severity of illness is dose dependent. So even if we are exposed, we're exposed while we're wearing masks because we do have a mask mandate and we're wearing masks when we're in the company of others and certainly on our campus. And so all of those factors bode really well for generating either asymptomatic or mild cases if we do indeed become ill. So I would say that was a long answer, but the short answer to your question is that we absolutely expect to see many cases because of the infectiousness of this current variant that is circulating. And so what we're really following is not the number of cases, but the severity of illness. And thus far, the overwhelming majority of our cases can be characterized as mild. And by mild, it, it doesn't mean that you won't feel lousy for a few days. You might have a, a really bad sore throat, but it would be highly unlikely for one to have to be hospitalized. And I would say that if we see a change in the severity of illness, maybe a, a different variant begins to circulate, then that will give us cause for pause and we'll reassess what our plans are. Thank you, Wendy. You actually just answered a follow-up question I was going to ask, which was, you know, what uh, what would the threshold be for us going remote at this point in time? And it sounds like what you're saying is um, it would really depend on the, the circumstances uh, of what the variants are looking like. But it, it, with Omicron, it, it sounds like perhaps there isn't that much of a concern for that. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And, and we would make that decision in consultation with university leadership, and our state and local Department of Health. Great, thank you. I do wanna remind everyone you can put questions in the chat, which we will get to at the end of, um, with the last 15 minutes. So I encourage you to post those as well, but we have plenty to get through here. Lindsay, there were a number of concerns expressed about immunocompromised individuals being more at risk with in-person learning. How can these individuals protect themselves or their family members? And what is RIT doing for these individuals? So I can answer part of those questions. And I um, think that a number of the questions in the chat um, are relate to concerns um, for folks who are immunocompromised. And um, I think it's really important um, to recognize that um, those people um, are part of our community and want to participate in the life of our community as fully as possible. And so um, for those of us um, here who might not um, ourselves be immunocompromised to remember that we don't know um, what somebody's medical situation is next to us and that we really need to um, take care to protect them as well as ourselves. Um, thinking specifically about what someone who is immunocompromised can do for themselves, um, we, this really comes back, I think, to um, higher quality masking, um, wearing either a double mask or an N95 or equivalent um, does afford you, the wearer, more protection. And if you're interacting with somebody else who is also wearing their mask, um, that really does lower um, your risk of exposure. And to go back to what Dr. Gelbart was saying, um, it helps the amount of virus that you're exposed to that would trigger the infection to be lower, which um, even if you are immunocompromised, your immune system is still present um, and functioning, albeit um, less strongly. And so if it, we give it time to respond, one is more likely to have a less severe um, illness course. Um, in terms of kind of what else RIT can do, that um, might be a question um, for the vice provost who's on the call too, in terms of thinking about um, what's happening in the classroom. I do know I work quite closely um, with Disability Services Office and they're working um, with faculty to create accommodations in classes where possible. It's really important to remember that RIT is an experiential learning opportunity and sometimes that learning can't occur in a remote setting and it really does need to be in person. Um, but that's really in the realm of um, academic affairs. Um, and 
I thought I had one other thing I was thinking about with in terms of the immunocompromised folks. No, I think it was a question that I saw in the chat and we'll wait um, till the end to get to those. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lindsay. We will get to some of the academic affairs questions a little bit later. So I'm gonna continue on here. Not surprisingly, we received a number of questions about the booster. Some were questioning how effective they are against the Omicron variant. Others were wondering what the point is if vaccinated individuals can still catch and transmit COVID, why would they need to get a booster or get vaccinated? Wendy, would you share with us what the science is telling us about boosters? Sure. You know, the, the science and the CDC currently recommend a booster for those who are age 12 and over. And we do know that COVID-19 vaccines are working extremely well to prevent serious illness, hospitalizations, and death. Um, we all know that they don't pre prevent all illness, but as with many vaccines outside of, of coronavirus vaccines, the goal is really to prevent serious illness, hospitalization, and death. And our public health officials are starting to see reduced protection over time against mild and moderate disease. And the, the data from clinical trials has shown that a booster shot increases the immune response. And with a better immune response, people then have better protection against severe disease. So better protection against severe disease will, will keep us out of the hospital. Students at RIT in particular often live in communal settings and they socialize in groups where transmission may be more likely. And in fact, last year, what we saw for transmission was transmission that occurred most often when students were socializing together and without masks. So, you know, again, we have a lot of control over our own health and it's back to that get vaccinated, boosted and wear a good mask. And we are really working hard to create a vibrant community for our students that is challenging and exciting and, and gives everyone that opportunity to learn and grow. And the booster mandate only helps us create such a place. The FDA has determined that the benefits of the booster far outweigh any potential risks in the age group of our students. Thank you. Lindsay, I think you and Wendy already kind of alluded to this, but could you talk to us about what the severity of cases is that you're seeing on campus? Sure. Um, so overall, um, the Omicron um, causes a very mild illness, if any illness at all. Um, of the positive tests we have, I would say somewhere 20, 30% of students are asymptomatic. Most students have a mild sore throat and headache um, that seems to last for 24 to 48 hours. A smaller group of students are having fatigue, body aches, and fevers, and their symptoms are generally lasting three, four, five days. Um, those students who develop a cough often will have a lingering post-viral cough. That's very common with respiratory viruses. Um, that post-viral cough is not an infectious cough. Um, and so part of what we do in the health center and with the contact tracing team is really um, talking with each student before they're released from isolation um, to make sure that they're really through that infectious period. Um, so certainly you may hear people coughing and it's appropriate to encourage them to get evaluated um, for that cough. Um, but uh, I also want people not to worry if that cough um, lasts longer because it's quite common with respiratory um, infections and it is not infectious. I just must say that again. And to get back to the original question, I'm really reassured Omicron is much more mild. It is more infectious and it is more mild. Um, and we're really not seeing severe disease. Um, no students at this point have um, been hospitalized um, and um, I anticipate that trend will continue, um, though we certainly you know, don't have all the answers. That's really helpful, thanks. 
Wendy, you mentioned the, you emphasized the importance of proper masking. Could you explain what that means and, and what the maskings are, masking options are? Yes, but can I respond a little bit to something that Lindsay said? Um, and, you know, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is, while I say that we don't necessarily have to identify every single positive test, you know, Lindsay spoke of the students that we have tested. And as you know, we're testing a limited number of students. We're testing regularly those students who are unvaccinated and those who are, for the most part, symptomatic, uh, perhaps their roommates or, you know, people, while the county is not doing contact tracing, we at RIT are still doing a, a, a limited type of contact tracing. But there are many students who, who may not even know that they have COVID. And, you know, that's the importance, again, of, of wearing the mask. I'll probably say that about 500 times tonight. And testing often provides a false sense of security because particularly with the Omicron variant that is highly transmissible, testing only gives you perhaps a false sense of reassurance for a moment in time because the minute you walk out of a testing environment and your test is negative, you may be around someone else who then transmits the illness. So we have to keep that in mind that testing is not the be all and end all. Our, our actions are really what are going to keep us the safest. And so Enid, you asked about mask, and I would say that the best mask is the mask that is comfortable and that you will wear consistently. A mask should be fitted tightly around the nose. There shouldn't be gaps around the cheeks or beneath the chin, and there should be contact with your skin all around. If your glasses fog up, it means that your mask fit is not great. So I would recommend that people get a mask that maybe has that metal piece that you can pinch around the nose to make it a little more tight around there. Cloth masks are lo alone are, are also not really great. And I've taken to calling uh, cute Etsy masks. I hope we don't have anyone on the call that um, is making at masks for Etsy, that those cute masks alone, um, I've been calling those face decorations. Um, but cloth masks coupled with another layer, perhaps a surgical mask, that really ups the protection for both the mask wearer and the people who come in contact with the person wearing a mask. You know, KN95s, N95s, um, those are available. They're in short supply um, and they have to be changed fairly frequently. So me personally on the RIT campus, you know, I can show you, I have my multi-layered cloth mask here. And then I double up with my blue surgical mask and I can, you know, wash my cloth mask so that you know, I don't feel quite as bad throwing that away every day and feel like I can get a little more use out of that. So that's what I'm doing on campus. You know, as well, I feel extremely safe on campus. So um, I tend not to want to waste those higher quality masks here and you know, really will do the doubling up of masks. I think that the masks, the cloth masks that RIT provided are really good there. They have a triple layer and that coupled with the blue surgical mask is really a great option. That's my favorite personal combination. Great, right, thanks. I wanna remind folks that you can put questions in the chat, which we will be getting to towards the end of the, the session. Um, I wanna shift gears a bit. Physical distancing was, was one of the, the big, we would say W's, we, we said, watch, wear your mask, wash your hands, watch your distance. And that's gone away this semester and, and well, this year. And I know there's, there's been a lot of questions and concerns voiced around that. Wendy, I think you and Lindsay both really talked about how what we learned was that physical distancing isn't, um, isn't as important as we originally thought. And so that really has reflected in some of these questions, in, in some of the, the changes that have occurred on campus. Um, is, there, is there anything you wanna elaborate on with that before I dive into some of those changes, Wendy? 
Sure. I would say that, you know, this is one of those things that when we first started, we didn't have all the information and we thought that the virus primarily traveled in larger particles that um, fell to the ground pretty quickly and certainly within those six feet. But we're finding, and particularly with Omicron, that the viral particles are really in, they're really very small and they may hang around longer and they can travel um, not far at all, or they can travel pretty, pretty far. And so just knowing that they can float around in a room, I would say that if you're in a closed room with someone, um, put your masks on because that is going to be, again, your best protection. And keep in mind that if everyone is wearing a mask, both the person who may or may not have COVID and the person whom they're with who may or may not have COVID, that is added protection. So, you know, one person wearing a mask is added to the second person wearing a mask. And, you know, it, it just adds to the maze that the virus might have to travel through in order to actually get to um, a person for someone to inhale. Thanks, Wendy. So since distancing isn't required in dining areas, and that is an area where masks do come off, Corey, um, could you speak to us a little bit about what Dining Services is doing to limit the spread? And if I were a student concerned about eating in the din dining units, what are my options? Oh, great. Thank you, Ina. So one of the things that we've done all since the beginning of when COVID has started in, in 2020 from a dining perspective is, is paying very close attention to what was going on at the state level as well as at the community level here um, in Monroe County, primarily because Rochester has a number of restaurants, I believe just over 600. So between uh, what was happening in RIT as well as locally, we actually had a significant amount of communication, not only with state officials and, and county officials, but also really talking to uh, restaurant owners in the area um, and keeping that dialogue in that community because we all are trying to obviously be safe and we also know that we do still have to eat. Uh, so from, from our perspective, we've the biggest thing for us is making sure that we were able to keep all of our locations open. We did have some instances where we've adjusted some hours here and there, but for the most part, all of our operations have remained open since the beginning um, of, of this year. Um, with that being said, we want to be able to have a number of locations that give you variety, but also be able to reduce some of the density in our dining locations. Uh, in addition to that, uh, for many of us, including our staff, I think the biggest thing from a protection standpoint that made all of us feel much better is that we do have a mask mandate on campus. I mean, the vaccinations do help, uh, but the fact that all of our community members have to mask, uh, that definitely helps us, particularly in our serving areas when you go get your food. Um, now, when it comes to sitting down in a dining facility, if you're not comfortable, then yes, every location that we have, you either can order or align, or if you come in person to pick up, um, and eat, you obviously have the option of either uh, to taking your food um, away um, and going to uh, back to your room or to a place on campus that you can physically distance um, appropriately. Um, but, I, but that's the biggest piece for us is making sure that at any location you have, you have the option to pick up your food and be able to take it somewhere else if you're not comfortable eating in any one of our, our dining room areas. Perfect. Thank you. So another area where physical distancing concerns have been expressed has been in classrooms, and, and it's led a number of people to ask why we aren't offering more online classes or why we can't offer in-person classes on Zoom as well. Chris, could you speak to this one a little bit? Uh, sure, Enid. Um, so I think what's already been discussed this evening helps frame the rationale behind, in part, the type of modality that we're using this semester and last semester with classes. Um, we surveyed students last year uh, using a pulse surveys and the overwhelming response from students was that they wanted in-person classes. Um, hybrid classes were not favored by students. Students struggled with them. Um, and uh, faculty actually uh, felt the same way. 
So in developing the schedule, we, we purposefully and very intently tried to produce a course schedule where we had 90% or in the vicinity thereof of in-person classes and 10% online. And this was really uh, in response to students. Uh, now, that's okay in, in, in and of itself, but then when you ask the question, well, what about COVID? Um, the safety plan that RIT has adopted um, uh, really, I think, uh, suggests that being in person in the classroom is a safe environment. We know that um, there's no evidence that COVID's been transmitted in the classroom, as long as the safety measures that RIT has put into place are observed and adhered to. So um, I think that it's twofold. One, we're, we're trying to um, respond to students and what students have told us they prefer and what faculty prefer. And we know from the safety measures that RIT has taken and from the discussion thus far tonight that um, we're in really good shape uh, in terms of the classroom situation. And so uh, I think that's the reason. Um, the other part of that question, Enid, I think was, well, why, why wouldn't we uh, want faculty to do both remote and in-person within the same classroom? That's the hybrid uh, or the flex model. And um, we, we didn't ask faculty to design their classes that way. We don't have any proof um, that, that that kind of dual modality is, is effective. It, it's, it's, it's really tough. It's tough for students and it's tough for faculty. And so what we have asked is that faculty be very conscious and very conscientious about ensuring that any student who's out ill in quarantine or in isolation or who has special accommodations from the um, from DSO, the Disability Service Office, that faculty work with those students on an individual basis to develop an academic continuity plan, which helps the student while there needs to be out of class um, so that they don't fall behind and that they're not penalized. And um, I, I just want, I want the students to know that um, this whole notion of academic continuity is something that faculty have always been held responsible for, even before COVID um, hit the scene. Um, we've always had students for various reasons who have had to be out of the environment for a period of time. So this is not a new concept to faculty. And uh, what is new is that we have now um, in the last almost two years, um, we've had to exercise this uh, option uh, for more students than we, we have in the past. So, so I think, so that's, uh, that's an important part of how we're uh, adapting and adjusting and trying to respond uh, from the faculty perspective in the classroom. Thank you. Another hot topic um, around distancing or lack thereof is transportation. Kate, a few people express concern about buses being overcrowded. After running only 50% capacity last year, I can completely imagine that they would feel pretty full at times. Um, could you talk to us about a bit about this and, and what's being done to address it? Sure. Thanks, Enid. Thanks for including us. Um, we're following CDC and New York State guidelines for public transportation. Uh, require masks for all riders. Our drivers are masked and behind a plexiglass shield. We have windows open on the buses. We're cleaning the buses every time they're on a break. Um, we have hand sanitizer available. If somebody forgot their mask, we have masks available on the buses. We are back to full capacity and that's in, in line with what the guidelines say. Um, there will be standing riders on the buses. It's a little different than it was maybe last year, but it's all safe. And um, we are ready to move people as they need to be moved around campus. And we continue to monitor ridership. If we need to make changes to routes, we're doing that. We've added an additional route for the APEX 
But as of right now, things seem to be moving quite fine for transportation and we're ready to make adjustments. We're monitoring every day. Thanks, Kate. So, um, John, I'm going to kick this one to you. Uh, you know, Kate mentioned the windows on the buses being opened, implying you know we're trying to in increase the ventilation there. So it's clear that that's an important strategy uh, in reducing potential transmission. Could you tell us a little bit about what RIT has done on this front in buildings with regards to ventilation? Yeah, thanks for the question, Enid. Um, you know, for the past 22 months, uh, a large group of us from across the university. So. You know, uh, there's been uh, faculty, some healthcare professionals, um, environmental health and safety people, um, architects, engineers. There's a whole bunch of us from across the university that have been working very hard to review ideas, technologies, and the guidelines provided by the CDC in New York State. And we've implemented a plan to exceed the recommendations of the CDC for ventilation systems. We've ensured that the maximum amount of fresh air is circulated within our buildings to, to the extent practical. And we've provided standalone air purifiers. We've also installed high efficiency filters in all of our recirculating air systems. We've installed air purification devices in our ventilation systems. These devices are proven to neutralize pollutants in the air, including viruses. And you should know that our working group is continuing to evaluate our air systems and available technologies that we can find that would help us improve our spaces even more. Thank you, John. I really appreciate that. I'm going to shift gears again a little bit. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions about uh, relating to what if an individual has COVID or, you know, there's someone around them has it. So I'm gonna to shift to questions relating to that now. Um, Lindsay, to start off, since you're the closest to this with working in the Student Health Center, could you just share with us what a student should do if they have COVID and, and what they should do if they think they have it, but they don't have off-campus transportation? Um, great question, Enid. And um, I would also direct people to the RIT Ready page, which has some FAQs um, because all of this information you don't hold into your head, you, know, you end up feeling nervous and you forget and just know that it's there on the RIT Ready page. So if you think that you have COVID and you happen to have access to a home test, um, then um, and so then you know you have COVID because you tested yourself, you should upload your positive result to the wellness portal. Um, and there's a form there to do it where we ask about symptoms. Um, someone from the contact tracing team will reach out to you. Um, in general, we reach out to on-campus students by phone and off-campus students through secure messaging, but encourage all students to pay attention to their secure messages in the wellness portal for that communication. Um, and we provide sort of additional guidance. The contact tracing team is working. Um, from uh, roughly eight or nine in the morning until about eight or nine o'clock at night addressing COVID related concerns. But let's say you don't have access to a home test and you're wondering what to do. Um, patient chat through the wellness portal is, is available seven days a week to um, talk with one of our nurses. Um, weekdays that is open from nine to four. On the weekends, it is open from 10 to one. Um, and those nurses can really help you determine whether you should get a test. If it's during the week, um, we can bring you into the health center if that's appropriate or refer you to Tiger testing um, um, to get tested for those symptoms. And then um, on the weekends, we don't have any testing on campus, but they can help troubleshoot how to facilitate getting you somewhere to get tested or perhaps how to take care of yourself until the time when you can get tested so that you can continue to protect those around you. And if you have symptoms that make you concerned for COVID, um, such as sore throat or headache or cough, um, we are seeing a little bit of loss of smell and taste with Omicron, but not as much as we had seen with the alpha variant. Um, so don't 
don't be hanging your hat on that one. So if you have those symptoms and you think, geez, it might be COVID, take care of yourself like it is COVID. And that means removing yourself from those social settings where you're interacting with people without your mask on. Um, and if you live on campus, you really want to reach out to that patient um, chat and talk to one of the nurses so that we can help you um, remove yourself from that situation until we know whether or not it is COVID. Um, if patient chat is closed um, and um, you have a concern, you can also email us at shccontacttracer at rit.edu. I'm going to let the interpreter catch up to me. <laughs> and um, uh, we are monitoring that email um, regularly as well. Um, so uh, we're really trying to be as accessible as possible um, to answer those questions. Thanks, Lindsay. And you can keep your camera on because I, I think you're the best person to answer this one too. Um, I know some of the rules uh, have changed around isolation and quarantine over the last few months. Um, so there's some confusion. Could you could you share what, what the, the rules are now or where they stand? Um, yes, and again, I wanna refer everyone to that RIT Ready um, FAQs. Um, we're trying to keep those updated. Um, there have been quite a few changes in, gosh, it's been less than a month that there have been multiple changes. <laughs> Um, but I think we're in a steady state now, um, so this will probably be um, the same for the whole semester. And we at RIT, um, that some of these are our policies, but most of them really are policies from our county health department, um, which follow CDC guidance. And so it's because that guidance has changed that um, RIT has needed to change some of our policies and practices to be in line with um, the county um, recommendations. So everyone says, oh, isolation is only five days now. Well, that's best case scenario. So isolation is when you've tested positive for COVID. If you're asymptomatic, which I mentioned 20 or 30% of our students who test positive are asymptomatic, um, then you would be able to be released on day five after that positive. Actually, you get released on day six after that positive test because it is five completed days of isolation. The day of the test is day zero, and then you need to have five completed days before you're released from isolation. If you only have symptoms for 24, 48 hours, um, then you would meet our criteria of being a febrile without a fever and improving symptoms for 48 hours when you get to the end of that fifth day. So again, you would be released after five days. But um, if you continue to have symptoms, isolation is for a full 10 days after um, the onset of symptoms or that positive test. Um, and we are evaluating all students um, to let them know when it is reasonable for them to come back to campus um, and circulate and um, pose lower risk to the community at that time. Um, for quarantine, which is when there's a high risk exposure, uh, quarantine is really monitoring your own behaviors um, and your own symptoms for 10 days because you're at risk for developing illness. Um, we do recommend um, getting a test um, around day four or five to see if you have developed asymptomatic COVID after that exposure. Um, for folks who are at highest risk of developing COVID, those who are not vaccinated or those who are not vaccinated and boosted if they're eligible for that booster vaccine, um, those folks actually need to quarantine um, you know, in an isolated way and not around others. People who are at lower risk, um, that quarantine can occur um, in um, their living situation and they're just asked to monitor their symptoms more closely. And that's in line with um, the CDC and our county um, health recommendations. So thanks very much for that question. It is complicated. It is on the FAQs. Um, and I don't mind if um, there are some student leaders listening in today, if your groups are kind of asking you questions, we're happy to come and talk to groups of students um, and sort of 
clarify all of it because it is really confusing. Yeah, I can definitely understand the confusion there. <laughs> um, Chris, this next one is for you. You mentioned um, that, that faculty have always had plans for academic continuity if there's interruptions for students. Um, one of the questions that came in, and as we see that the numbers of cases for employees going up too, was is there a plan in place for academic continuity if faculty members get sick? Well, actually, um, there there is. Um, so the provost has um, uh, been communicating since before the semester started with faculty and has asked them to do two things, to think about seriously um, what they would do if they needed to be out for a period of time. And so she has given faculty the um, uh, green light if they have to be out for five days because they're um, ill to um, have a plan in place that in most cases will in involve using Zoom if they're well enough uh, to continue the class online and or to work with their department chair if they're not to figure out how best to continue uh, the course progress for students. And sometimes that means another faculty member taking over the class if the faculty member is not well enough uh, or um, some, other, um, some other means. So, so there is, um, and um, uh, we, we're trying to keep track of that. We've not received reports to date um, that there have been uh, uh, large numbers of faculty that have found themselves in this situation, but but, but um, faculty do understand that that's, um, that's uh, what the procedure is that they should follow. The other thing that the provost has asked faculty to do because of the uncertainty this semester, or, you know, when we started the semester, we just weren't sure um, whether the severity of the cases would rise. It, we knew it wasn't the number of the cases as Wendy said early on this evening, but it's the severity that we need to follow. Um, and so um, the provost also asked faculty to, um, to think about what they would do if the severity of the cases became um, so great and the institution found itself in a position where we needed to modify our, our, our plans for in-person instruction and pivot. So two things are operating. The one is what happens to me as a faculty member? They know they could, they're gonna work um, to uh, continue the instruction uh, in, in one of several ways. And then what happens if, if the situation at the greater university changes? That's helpful, thank you. Um, back to thinking about isolation and quarantine since we were talking about that. Carla, this one's for you. What support is being provided to students who are or have been relocated in order to provide additional isolation and quarantine spaces? Sure. Um, we realized that it would be um, very impactful for the students to be moved during the beginning of the semester. So RIT Housing and many other departments that are supporting the services for these students strove to make sure that we made the move as easy as possible and the living environment as comfortable as possible. Um, so we pulled together some uh, benefits for the students to help that happen. Um, everybody, we focused in first on how are they going to move access to food, internet access, transportation, laundry, those kind of things. Uh, what we did for all students who were moved, and we did move students to the Strathallen, we moved some students to Apex, and some students at the RITN were relocated from the student uh, side of the facility to the hotel side of the facility. So everyone got an immediate 20% reduction of their rent. Everybody went into a private room with a private bathroom because that's the type of uh, room that the students were all moving from. Um, support moving, we provided all sorts of moving materials, boxes, labels, tape, and we hired a professional mover to move students' items to the place that they were being relocated to. The students at Apex and at the RATN already had uh, an established uh, shuttle service to get them back and forth to campus. However, the students at the Strathallen needed transportation. So parking and transportation put together a robust shuttle service and schedule for that. 
In addition to that, any student moving there who had a car is given a temporary parking pass, so they are able to drive their car to campus. And in addition to that, every student at Strath Allen were, was given a $100 Uber card. So if they missed a shuttle or they decided to stay later on campus and needed to get back to the hotel, they didn't need to worry about it. They could call an Uber and use the card that we gave them. Um, everybody has internet access, free laundry. Uh, at the Strath Allen, they are given a weekly linen service also. Um, Food access for the students at Strath Allen, we did something additional to them in case they didn't need to come to campus. We didn't want them to have to take a shuttle to come to campus to use their dining plan. So they have a $500 uh, credit weekly at the Strath Allen to buy food there. So they don't have to make a special effort to get to campus to use that dining card if they are not, if they don't need to be here for classes. So those are the things that we've done for supporting the students now. When it's time to bring them back to campus, we will again provide professional movers and transportation to get them back onto campus at a convenient time and make the move as easy as possible. Thanks, Carla. Uh, I, I can imagine the menu at Strathallion is probably pretty uh, tempting. Uh, so it, it, I'm, I'm glad to hear of all those efforts. Um, Corey, continuing on with the isolation and quarantine questions, uh, as, as Carla mentioned, we did um, move some students around in the inn. So currently there's a split where there's some isolation quarantine space on a floor, and then there's also some regular housing on the floor. Uh, how are the students in the regular housing being kept safe? Can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, yes, I can. So in terms of, of overall numbers, uh, the IRTN and Conference Center, uh, we uh, provided 25 additional spaces for quarantine and isolation. Uh, so basically, when you think of the IRTN and Conference Center, understand that it is split between university housing as well as being a hotel. Um, and just based on the, and the, the laws and, and processes that we have to follow, you can't have students in or anyone in isolation being within the confines of a hotel. So the way that's broken up um, it has like your North Tower, your West Tower, and your, and your Center Tower, and we do have those split up appropriately between what is truly a hotel versus what is uh, where we're going to have our students who may need to use the isolation space. So all of those rooms are set up to be uh, one bedrooms um, that they could be converted to two, but we typically only have one person within them if we need it. They also have their own private bath, and we've also set up them to be able uh, to order food service uh, from the restaurant pedals right inside the uh, hotel. Um, so with that being said, in terms of uh, interfacing with the community, if you're sick, you really don't have to because you do have all the amenities you need in your, definitely in your room, um, as well as food is being delivered directly to you. So it's very easy for us to keep the community safe because we're not having our, our students who may be ill um, interface with any of our healthy students um, or uh, members that are coming to the hotel. Thanks, Corey. I think that they also are on separate ventilation units, each room, right? It's not that like large HVAC like we would see in our consolidated buildings. I think each room has its own like heating and cooling system too, right? Uh, that is correct. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, Chris, this one's coming back to you. Um, there were a number of questions related to class accommodations for students that have to be absent due to COVID. And I know you touched on this a little bit earlier. Some were concerned that their absences would count against them in their grade because um, they're only allowed a limited number of absences. What, and, and others were concerned that their professors weren't adhering to their DSO accommodations. What's the policy for this and what if a student also, and what if a student feels sick, but they haven't tested positive for COVID? What should, should they go to class? What should they do? Okay, so uh, three separate um, questions there. Um, on, the first, on the first question, um, I, I think uh, it's fair to say that um, the faculty have been um, uh, really, um, collaborating with, uh, with the provost and their D 
deans and department chairs on how best to be flexible in this environment. And the message here has been flexibility. The provost communicates weekly with faculty on a, um, a communication she puts out and has office hours at least once a week. And every time uh, she meets with the faculty and in her office hours, she stresses the fact that in this time uh, of uncertainty, we need to be flexible. So even if there have been a, um, attendance policies that faculty have had, um, we want to give students the benefit of the doubt here. And um, uh, secondly, that um, if a student is ill, and that was your third question, um, we don't want students to come to class if they're ill. Um, and we don't want faculty um, to feel that they need to be asking for doctor's excuses. Um, and uh, because uh, the idea here is to develop an environment where students can feel that they're safe. And, and part of that is the safety plan that we have in place, but also part of that is ensuring that you're not putting yourself into a situation if you're not feeling well. So, so, um, so faculty uh, have a responsibility uh, to uh, uh, respect that, and um, we we are hoping. And um, last semester didn't have a, a lot of cases where this was was not adhered to. Now. Um, the other thing I want to say about this is that um, the provost has also put together an academic continuity team, and that team has developed a set of uh, guidance for faculty on what to do in these cases and how best to work with students who are who are missing class and what does it mean to put together an academic continuity class, uh, plan. So faculty aren't being left on their own to come up with this. We, we're providing a lot of support. Um, and when you ask the question about DSO accommodations, um, um, Catherine Lewis and her team, uh, I think, have really done a good job of, of, of laying out for faculty what the responsibilities are when there's an accommodation. There really is not a choice here about whether to um, uh, respect that accommodation. If a student has an accommodation, we have the responsibility to follow through on it. So. Um, if students are feeling that that they're being put in jeopardy or there's um, their their accommodations not being followed, of course we always like them to talk to the, their faculty member first. And if if they do and that's not successful or they don't feel comfortable, then to go to um, their department chair or to their academic advisor so that we can be sure that um, students are being supported to be successful in their classes. I also want to say that just today, the provost sent out a notification to all faculty and reminded them of the lag that sometimes occurs between the time the registrar's office notifies them of, of isolation or quarantine, or even when students are experiencing other illness, and uh, reminded faculty that students can inform faculty of, of their um, uh, on inability to attend classes uh, by emailing them or just using the remote access needs widget, which is in my courses. There is a widget in my courses that students can use. And um, the provost today asked faculty to, to, to please consider making sure that that widget is in a primary uh, spot in their my course shell. So students know that they can go in and report to faculty as soon as they know they're not gonna be in class. So there's no lag time. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm going to shift gears again a little bit. We received some questions also about following rules or not following rules. Um, Nicole, I'm going to start with you. I know this is one of your favorite subjects. <laughs> what, uh, what should we do, student, faculty, staff, if we see someone that isn't following COVID policies? And an extension of that, what, if, what happens if someone is blatantly violating a policy versus they might just have accidentally slipped up. Sure, thank you. So the, the major policy, I think when people ask this question now in the, in the world that we're living in now is, is larger, largely around masking and masking compliance. 
And so I'll, I'll focus it on that, although there are some other COVID protocols, whether that be uh, submitting your vaccine or booster um, or things like that, that um, are, are certainly also things that we're following up on, but are less transparent to, um, to peers or to others in the environment. So masking is the primary place where this question is coming up. And what I would say is that there's sort of two groups uh, of people or two groups of reasons why someone is maybe not following um, particularly the masking and, and those COVID protocols. And the first group are people who may either have forgotten or may be fatigued. And so they may, they're not refusing to wear a mask. They just forgot to pull it back up or maybe they've been wearing it all day and they just finished their sandwich and they didn't pull it up the second that they swallowed their last bite. They just are sort of maybe trying to have a few more minutes before they put that mask up. In those cases, you're not talking about a, a sort of negative or combative um, or challenging situation. It's really just someone who was very likely to respond appropriately to a gentle reminder or a, just a, an ask from someone else to say, hey, you know, I'm wondering now that you finished your meal, if you can pull your mask back up or, you know, you're, you're in my hallway, in the residence halls, you're not wearing your mask, we're supposed to wear masks here, can you please pull those up? So, one of the first things is that we all have responsibility as a community in this and to understand that our community has been overwhelmingly supportive of this. And we really want to ask people to try to help one another to be successful as part of our community response. That being said, there are some individuals in some situations where it is more of a, a significant refusal to comply with a policy. In those cases, or if someone is uncomfortable addressing it directly, you can either find someone in the area who is maybe more comfortable, uh, you know, some uh, faculty member or staff member that's in the area, something like that, or a COVID reporting form can be completed, which is on the RIT website, and we follow up on all of those outreaches. Thanks, Nicole. Chris, in the classes, what should a student do if another student in their class isn't following masking rules or is eating in the class or something along those lines and the professor refuses to do something about it? Yeah, I think Nicole hit on this. Um, we, um, we prefer to um, uh, have the student first try to approach the uh, professor and ask the professor to remind those students. And, um, you know, we, we've even advised faculty to begin their class by reminding everyone in the classroom of the mandate for masking. Uh, and that really we, we have zero tolerance um, for non-masking. But we know that sometimes that, that there are uh, individuals that just aren't, aren't going to follow the rules. So going to the faculty member first, and then if that's unsuccessful, um, I think using the form that Nicole talked about that's on the website because every one of those situations is followed up on and, and um, would be uh, would be followed up. Uh, uh, on. So that would be my my advice. Thank you. Um, one more quick question for you: Are faculty members allowed to remove their masks in class? Currently, no. Uh, you know the. Um, the provost is taking this on a week-to-week um, -week basis, uh, has asked faculty uh, to, even when they're behind the plexiglass at the podium, to mask. Um, the provost is evaluating this uh, at the end of each week and um, informs faculty uh, beginning the next week what the position is. And so uh, right now, faculty are not um, removing their masks. Um, whether this will change, it may change moving forward, depending on what we see uh, with the numbers, but right now, no. Thank you. All right, we're gonna shift gears again to talk about events and visitors. Sandy, what advice would you give to students that are planning events for the semester? And will clubs be able to continue to meet and have events? So as you know, we put out some new guidelines for events on campus this semester, um, which do allow for events to happen. Um, we have put restrictions on some larger events where you have to present evidence of vaccination with outside people coming to those events. And we have limited um, 
food at events. Um, so we know that that is one of those times when people do remove their masks. So yeah, events can absolutely happen on campus and they are in fact. Um, and many of the ones that had been planned with more elaborate food options um, at the events have been tamped down and they're still going on. Um, I would encourage students to look in campus groups. And as for clubs and organizations, they are continuing to um, have activities and have, at, have meetings. Um, there is no restrictions on those. We are simply following the guidelines that we have in place. Great, thank you. Um, Nicole, this one is for you. Could you explain the rationale for the housing visitor policy? Sure. So at the beginning of each of the last uh, few semesters, we have started the first few weeks with a more restrictive housing visitor policy um, because we had so many people returning from break or from summer or from break a, a year ago into the residential communities coming back from all over the country, in some cases from all over the world, having a lot of travel and knowing that that was the, uh, the opportunity for kind of the, the greatest initial spread if people were positive. And so we've started each of the past few semesters, including this one, with a more restrictive policy until we kind of settled, settled everything back down. We watch the numbers. We work in consultation with the health center and looking at the county numbers um, as well. And then what we have done and the pattern we expect to follow is that as we watch those numbers, we'll, there'll be a time when we feel like, nope, the numbers are, are kind of plateauing off and, and this is the right time to be able to open that up and at least have RIT visitors, um, our other RIT students um, in, in the residential areas. Thanks. Sandy, back to you. Um, you mentioned that we had just issued some updates on uh, the event policy. Um, and in there was some restrictions on food for many types of events. Why is food still allowed at hockey games? So if you recall, we put in a mandate for um, participants, all participants at hockey games, um, many of which are coming from the outside community, have to provide evidence of vaccination. We did that actually in the fall. Um, we recently updated that to also be in line with the current guidance on the eligibility for vaccines, which is for anyone five and older. So those are bit, have been put in place. What we've also done is we have made announcements during the hockey games um, last weekend and, and I think today, I'm not on campus today, but I know there was a game this afternoon, um, that individuals should feel comfortable in spreading out if they prefer um, when there is open seating and that we are asking people to mask up and that if you're eating, you eat at your seat and that you mask up after. Um, there is also, you know, uh, a lot of really excellent circulation in that facility. It is a different environment. And we feel like we are also in line with other um, venues, arenas, um, both professional and in college settings. And it was also um, something we discussed with the county health commissioner who was also supportive. Thank you. Keeping with the uh, sports uh, themes here, another question, Sandy. NCAA athletes are allowed to compete without wearing a mask, but vocal groups have to wear masks when they perform. Why is there a difference? So NCAA um, guidelines um, require us to be testing unvaccinated um, athletes um, three times a week and that if there is an instance where we have found that there is an athlete who is positive and that it was a result of a, let's say, social gathering outside, we've tested additional ones there, but that the guidance from the Sports Medicine Research Institute is that it is not healthy to be competing at that high level of exertion with a mask. And so we are doing all of the mitigation efforts 
um, so that we allow them during competition to wear a mask and to not wear a mask. Um, and we have instituted masks during practice again um, as a measure for the start of this semester. So we are following the guidance from the Sports Medicine Institute, and that is in the best interest of the student athletes who are you know, at a high level of physical exertion. Those same guidelines do not exist for things like vocal groups. And we actually looked to the Eastman School of Music and how they were managing that um, with their performances and, and their teams as well. So again, we're following guidelines from the research in these particular areas. And with the NCAA, they have been a great partner for us in helping us to develop um, the protocols to help limit, because we cannot eliminate all risk. Thanks, Sandy. Um, I want to, I wanted to make sure we had enough time for some of the questions that have come in the chat. So I'm going to shift gears to those. Um, I did want to let everyone know we did get a couple of questions about commencement. Um, a decision as far as vaccination requirement for attendees will be made in February. So that is coming up. We're just um, uh, waiting on the, uh, to see kind of where things stand and how Omicron is progressing and, and COVID is progressing. So they're, they're kind of putting decision um, as late as they can without inconveniencing people. All right, so I'm gonna shift to some of the questions we've received. Uh, two thirds of the questions that came in, we already have addressed through the questions we've been going through. So I do want to dive in and we're gonna put some people in the hot seat. Um, let me see here. Chris, um, a question came in um, mentioning that you had talked about how students were surveyed as far as their preferences for hybrid or for online. Um, and a question came in wondering whether or not graduate students' responses were compared as a unique population, given that many of them have young children and, and some additional challenges in their success in graduate school really depends on their access and timing in labs, et cetera. So could you talk to us about what, if that was a different population and how that landed? I think the survey that went out last year was really, was really focused on undergraduates. Um, and so this is an in interesting question um, and one that's timely because we're, um, we're planning to send out another pulse survey to students um, on the course modality preferences. Um, and so um, I, will, I will take this back to that planning group to um, explore how we can ensure that the graduate students' voice is heard on this issue. I really understand the, the challenges that, are, um, that some of our graduate students face when you're juggling um, school with family responsibilities and um, it can be tough. So um, I think the answer is we, we didn't really focus last year on the graduate student population, but um, there's a chance now moving forward that we can. So um, thank you for raising that. And um, it's, it's really an important, it is an important uh, uh, population that we don't want to overlook in any way. Thanks, Chris. Sandy, I'm going to kick another one to you. Um, my screen went dark there. Okay. Is the administration also working from home or are they only expecting students and staff to circulate on campus? Um, so at last time, time, time I checked, administration was staff. And yes, we are on campus. Um, I'm not on campus today because I'm actually attending the NCAA convention with members from our athletic department, but you will find me uh, in my office probably five days a week, if not six when I'm on the weekends attending different events. So no, staff are on campus as our faculty, as our students. We do have some situations with staff who are doing flexible work arrangements and some of that is actually helping us with space. So, you know, there is there are some benefits to some of the things that we have learned over the course of this pandemic. And that is that we could use some shared office options when we are short on space. 
So we do have staff who have what we call flexible work arrangements where they might be working remotely one day a week and then on campus four days. You will also just see on this particular call when Dr. Gelbard has been responding, she's sitting in her office in the August Center. Um, so there is evidence that yes, our administrative staff and are, are on the campus. Thanks, Sandy. Um, Lindsay, a few questions came in uh, in the chat and also um, from earlier questions. Can you talk a little bit about plans that may be in place for how to help RIT students with long COVID? Um, that's so long COVID um, is a chronic condition and um, we are still learning a lot about it and how best to treat and manage it from a medical standpoint. From an academic and learning standpoint, um, it's a chronic condition much like many other chronic conditions and um, folks in the Disability Services Office are a great resource in helping students identify what kinds of accommodations um, are going to enable them to be successful academically and really partnering with the student and faculty um, to see what kinds of accommodations are achievable um, for that learning opportunity. Um, I do want to mention that when we think about long COVID, um, one of the questions really was about kind of who is going to get it, how can we prevent it, um, and there's a lot we still don't understand about who is most vulnerable. Um, it does seem that people with more severe illness are more likely to develop long COVID. So really, um, I'm relieved. Um, we have it's too early for us to know if Omicron is going to be associated with the long COVID syndrome or not. It simply hasn't been around for long enough. Um, but I am hopeful that the mild um, cases that we are seeing now um, suggest that it will become less likely. Again, we just don't know and um, it's hard um, kind of living with this much uncertainty um, right now, but that's um, kind of what we're all faced with. Thank you. I'm trying to get my video working and it's for some reason not. There we go. Okay. Um, let me look for it. Got another one up here. Um, Wendy, I'm going to throw this one to you. And I think it's more of a, a recommendation that I think we can take into consideration. Um, one of the, um, the questions was, was essentially that, you know, there's, they, they understand what we're talking about, that there's less severity with cases. Um, and, and they understand that, but they're, they're still concerned about the risk. And is there a possibility that we could at least increase our messaging around masking, potentially bring some of the um, COVID crew back to, you know, hold signs to remind people on campus and, and really just up the reminders for those things? Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. We can certainly bring the COVID crew back. And um, I can absolutely pass that along. So keep up, keep coming up with good ideas. Wendy, I'm going to keep you here since you're already lit up. Um, also, some questions came in about the difference in decision for what U of R chose to do versus what RIT did as far as um, us starting in person and U of R going remote. Can you, um, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. I think all of these decisions are multifaceted. And at U of R, I know that they were having... Uh, great difficulty with the numbers of their faculty and staff that became ill and had to be out with COVID. And as well, they were closely affiliated with a medical center. So some of that staff may have been required to support more than one area. And here at RIT, we did not see that same surge that U of R saw. And that made us feel more comfortable bringing people back to campus because we had the staff that were able to support our students. Thanks. Lindsay, I don't know if you had something to add. I saw you pop up there, so feel free. Well, it's, a, it's sort of tangentially related. So 
Um, a lot has been made of the fact that U of R decided to start remotely. Um, and I just checking the U of R dashboard, the number of cases um, that they've had on the river campus in the 14 days is about half of what we have had at RIT and their student body is about half the size of ours. So um, I think that really speaks to the fact that um, classes in person is not really where we're seeing that kind of transmission risk occur and that transmission is occurring in social settings and human beings, we are social people. Um, and we can try to make those social interactions safer, but I don't think it's reasonable for us to expect to eliminate our social interactions with one another. Um, and so um, I, I really, it, at some level, it was an experiment to come back, right? I mean, everything that we're doing with COVID, we are learning. We're making educated, reasonable guesses. And um, in this particular instance, I think we really have determined that um, starting in person made as much sense as anything else did. The other thing that I would add is that, you know, people are guessing when the Omicron surge might occur in their community. And the first few weeks of every semester in a pandemic are in my mind the most difficult because we don't sit with the community rate of infection. We start out with a combined rate of where all the students are coming from. So some of you may have come from areas where Omicron was quite prevalent and others of you may have come from areas where it hadn't yet made itself known. So until we equilibrate and get to that point where we have the RIT level of, of infection, it, it takes a few weeks. So, you know, some people were, were trying to make that prediction. I, I can say that, you know, the good news is that it appears as if New York State is on the downtrend and specifically Monroe County has reached its peak and is, is moving on the downtrend. So that's good for our community. And we, you know, just have to get to that same level with our, our IT community as well. And I think that, that we're pretty much there. Wastewater is looking promising and, and that's really gonna give us the most information. Thank you. Okay, I've got one last one for Sandy and then a, a broad question for, for everyone. So Sandy, a student asked, they, they hear oftentimes that there's a team making decisions on COVID policies but it's never specified who's on the team. Could you speak to who is making those decisions? So um, President Munson has put together a team from across the university that obviously includes um, folks like the provost, um, Dr. Waters, myself, Dr. Gelbard. Um, we have representation from the faculty um, or academic affairs, Sue Provenzano, who helps to manage a lot of the different pieces of academic programs and um, events, as well as Jen Schneider, who is an expert in things like wastewater testing and, and other um, emergency protocols, as well as folks from facilities and, and across the university. Um, I'd have to get out my list. I don't have it in front of me, but we actually consult with also Dr. Mendoza, who is our county health commissioner, President Munson, along with other college presidents, meet with him regularly. Dr. Gelbard and Dr. Phillips both also speak with him. And we're basing our decisions on the evidence that we are getting from places like the CDC and other infectious disease um, experts. You know, we're not on an island with our, with our protocols. I am here, as I mentioned, at the NCAA conference, and there are about a thousand plus schools represented here in person. And I was part of an institute and of 
folks who have athletics reporting to them. And we were posed the question, how many of you opened in person or remotely this semester? All but one of us um, said we opened in person because we all feel that we're basing our um, decisions around vaccination and boosters and masking on the evidence. And those are the key pieces that every single school has bought into that are still operating in person and managing a vibrant campus community. We know, as um, I think Dr. Phillips said, we are relational people. Um, and that is what we are as humans. And so we expect to be able to have a campus environment that is rich and vibrant and that we're doing all of the things we can to mitigate risk because we know it's impossible to eliminate all risk for every situation. Um, I would encourage every single person on our campus to do what feels right for them and also to look at the evidence because it is really clear from across all um, different entities and across the world, there are millions and millions of people who have gotten vaccinated and it is what is controlling and helping to mitigate this virus. Thank you so much, Sandy. I wanna close with one last question. Um, and it's, you know, we're in a time that's extremely stressful for all of us. We're all dealing with a variety of issues and the stress of, of the COVID situation we've been living on with so long is, is really starting to grate on people. So I wanted to see if some of you would be willing to share your strategies on how you maintain your well being. So let me start with um, Corey. Could you tell me a strategy that you employ for, for maintaining your well being? I'll give you a couple. Um, first and foremost, for, for me, uh, everyone, I've, I've, I've been blessed during, during this COVID time where uh, me and my wife uh, of two years, uh, we just had a little one. She's uh, 15 months old. Her name is Victory. Um, as in like, Victory is mine. <laughs> and uh, she definitely brings me joy. So I definitely spend a lot of my time when, when I'm not working spending time with her and my wife because those are the things that bring me joy and also trying to find ways to be able to interact with my family members and friends and some of them are in other states. So utilizing Zoom and Slack and all those different avenues to be able um, to keep to, to give me that joy because those are the things that bring me energy. Now on top of that, uh, during COVID and, and just getting married and so on and so forth, uh, one of the things that I've also have ran into was I gained a little bit of weight there. Uh, got a little bit too comfortable uh, between COVID and a lot of love weight. So I just had to stop making excuses and I had to make sure that I had to work out on a regular basis. So I work out about six days a week. Um, I do CrossFit. I typically have to go at 5 a.m. because I have no other time to go. Um, most people think that that's crazy or that I'm actually dedicated, but ultimately it gives me energy. It makes me more mentally sound. And I have, a, I have a number of reasons that I need to be healthy to be here for my little one and my wife for a number of years. So those are some of the things that I do just to keep myself um, in a good mental and physical space. Thanks, Corey. Um, I'd like to ask all the uh, panelists just to turn on your, your video so everyone can see us. And I want to give, we have one minute left. So I wanna give Lucas the last word on his strategies to maintain well-being as a current student and a lot of the pressures, especially as, a, as the current president of SG, as well as many other things, I'm sure. Yeah, no, thank you, Enid. Um, personally, uh, and honestly, just before we end, I think just speaking as a student, I think there's a piece of and remembering what it was like being a student when we were entering COVID. Um, not only the restrictions that we had in commencement, but I want to have my brothers and sisters and grandma to be able to watch me walk across the stage. I know a lot of our freshmen want to be able to go invite each other to go watch a movie in the lounge. So what are like the things that were given up as we continue to look at these restrictions and what that means? But I think at the end of the day, RIT, and you always look at the numbers and you can even do it comparatively, as I think one of our MDs talked about here, is RIT is always going to be one of the safest places to be in Rochester and even across the nation. So 
I can promise you as a student that interacts with many of these guys in these video conferences that priority number one is always our safety. Um, so, but lastly, some things to do as you want to continue to be positively well, as well as um, in wellness and overall, I think for me and a lot of S years, what we've been doing is going to the hockey game every weekend. Uh, we, I think this is the most hockey games I've watched and luckily they've been doing pretty good this uh, season. So this Friday, the 21st at seven and the 22nd at seven, hockey goes up against Niagara. So hit t- tickets are free. So hope to see many of you there. Right. On that note, I will thank, say thank you to all of our attendees. If there are questions we did not get to, please send them to the um, PPG email address um, and you can pose those questions. We will work on getting answers posted into the RIT Ready site as, as we, um, at, or point you to the answers if they're already there. Um, thank you all our panelists and our attendees for your, for your time. And um, I hope you all get a little time tonight and this weekend to maybe enjoy some outdoors and enjoy some, some good company. So take care everyone and be well.